So good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to present our next invited speaker, Apurva Kare. He made his bachelor degree at the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta, and then decided to move for his PhD to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. And he finished his doctorate in 2006. And after that, he held several postdoc positions at the University of California at Riverside, at Yale, at Stanford. And then five years ago, he went back to his home country, to exactly this place here, to the Indian Institute of Science, where he is professor now. So his background is in algebra. His thesis is um, on representation theory of algebras, but not but. He's still doing that, but he has branched out in several directions since then. So you'll find papers in um, group theory, geometry, more precisely, theory of polytopes, one can even discover a paper in number theory. And um, he has developed a strong interest in linear algebra and analysis, where he's interested in positivity and total positivity of matrices and operators. And he has become interested in combinatorics, where I believe the link is formed by the sure functions. So for his scientific work up to today, he was just this year elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. And we are now looking forward to his talk, which indeed is on sure functions, namely inequalities and equalities satisfied by them. Okay, I, yeah. So first of all, thank you very much to Christian for the extremely kind introduction and very comprehensive one. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, I was actually going to start by saying that my PhD is in representation theory and then recently I have been, and so representation theory, the name of Shur, of course, is uh, very well known. Shur polynomials are characters of representations of semi-simple Lie algebras and of the general linear group. Uh, Recently, I've branched out as well into analysis and matrix positivity. And uh, the name of Shure shows up there as well in terms of something called the Shure product theorem, which helps, which tells you things that help. Uh, so it's about functions that act entry wise on matrices. So if you've seen some analysis and sort of the spectral calculus, you know, functions act on the eigenvalues of symmetric matrices. But there's also research on functions acting entry-wise on matrices in analysis. Uh, and the Schur product theorem is one of the first results about in that direction. So Schur himself was, of course, a remarkably versatile mathematician. There is an entire survey uh, by Dim and Katz Nelson. You can find it on the archive uh, on the contributions of Schur in analysis. And it is about 100 pages long. So he had many, many things uh, to contribute in many different fields. And uh, so my interest in even in the common in algebraic combinatorics showed up from the analysis side, starting from the Schur product theorem and going down a long line of results. The interesting thing was in that analysis side, eventually Schur polynomials from representation theory turn out to uh, play a rather important role. And so I will try to tell you some of that those connections today, how exactly Schur polynomials show up in analysis. So uh, hence the term inequalities. So yeah, so let us begin then <clears throat> with Schur polynomials. And so these I will denote with a slightly, so I will use slightly different convention than what is known in the literature. So given a decreasing n tuple of integers, these are the powers, the exponents, the Schur polynomial over a field, let's say characteristic zero, uh, z or so q or r, is you know so you take this generalized Vandermond matrix, huh? So two two changes. One is that I'm adding the staircase partition to the powers. So that's why I have strict inequalities here. 
And one is that I'm taking finitely many variables, not infinitely many. Okay? So I just take therefore n many variables, n many powers, and I take the square matrix, I take the determinant. Uh, if you switch to variables, if you switch to rows, it's alternating. So it's divisible by ui minus uj, and hence by their product, which is exactly the Vandermont determinant here. Right? So, so therefore the ratio is an actual polynomial function, and then you can extend it to the entire field from distinct entries. Yeah, so anyway, this is the Schur polynomial. This is the Vandermont determinant notation. Okay, so as, as, a, you know, as, as Christian mentioned as well, so you know, Schur functions show up in somehow both these areas. So they are the characters of irreducible representations of GLN or the Lie algebra of SLN. And they are a basis of homogeneous symmetric polynomials. Yeah. So the, the only dif the distinction, the notation to keep in mind is that I will use strict inequalities because I'm adding the staircase partition. Okay, and then one has this uh, while dimension formula, I guess, if you set all these, all the variables to one, you get a ratio of the differences of powers by J minus I. Those are uh, one band remote by another. Okay, so this is one way to define sure polynomials, I believe from Cauchy, and then this is attributed to Littlewood using semi-standard Young tableau. So here, so just as an example, which of course, to set notation, but I will come back to it later. So two examples. One is again, so I'll keep n equals three and let's take the powers to be four, two, and zero. So as I said, since I already added the staircase partition, I must subtract it to get the shapes. So I have, so four, two, zero minus two, one, zero, the staircase partition, sorry, I should have mentioned the staircase partition is two, one, zero for three let for n equals three. Right? So you subtract from this two, one, zero, you get, uh, Two one zero. So you draw pick. You draw diagrams like this with um, two rows, two cells in the top row, one cell in the next row, and zero cells in the bottom row. And you have n equals three. So you fill these cells with the alphabet one, two, and three, uh, with the rule. So without the letters, this is a young diagram. Or yeah. And then once you fill them in, you get a young tableau. And what are semi-standard young tableau? The rule is that entries must weakly increase along each row and entries must strictly increase along each column. So there are these eight different fillings that you can get, semi-standard Young Tableau. And now what you do is for this, you write down U1 square U2 plus U1 square U3 plus U1 U2 square. And you write all these eight letters down, eight monomials down. So um, the weights of each tableau. These two give you the same monomial, so you get a coefficient of two. And this is the Schur polynomial. So this is the other way of defining it. And in this particular case, it's very easy to see that this polynomial is exactly the same as the previous definition, because 4 to 0 means you're taking the generalized Vandermond with these powers, but that's just the usual Vandermond with the squares of the variables. So you get the product of ui square minus uj square divided by the usual Vandermond, ui minus uj. So you get ui plus uj. Right. So that's so these two definitions give you one and the same thing. That's a theorem, of course. And there are you know several proofs in the literature, but uh, yeah. So um, from this definition, you see that sure polynomials are homogeneous and symmetric because you're dividing an alternating polynomial by the van der Mond. You don't see that the coefficients are positive integers, non-negative integers. From this definition, you see that the coefficients are non-negative and they're homogeneous, but not that they are symmetric. <clears throat> Okay, another definite, another example. So let's say the powers are three, two, and zero. Then I, again, first subtract the staircase. So I get two, one, and zero. Sorry, I, I subtract that. I get one, one, and zero. And I know that one cell here, one cell here, entries must strictly increase. So these are the only three. Okay, so I will, as I said, come back to these two examples later for the inequality side. Okay, so now let's begin with the equality side. So I want to tell you about, sorry, about a couple of, hello, yeah. So a couple of very classical results, which we all know. Well, at least the first one everybody knows, I think. Yeah. So yeah, so this is Cauchy's result. And interestingly, it this is where, this might be the, yeah. This might be the first place that I have seen a function acting entry-wise on matrices, and it is not in analysis although that's what I you know, like to do, work with. But yeah, so take a function and I'll define F square bracket A to be the function acting on AIJ. So the matrix you get by each entry being transformed. 
Now take two uh, you know, vectors, ui and vj, and so apply the geometric series to entry wise to each function. What you get is, and then take the determinant, you get this beautiful formula, which is, well, you just get vu times the so Vandermon in the u's, because this is alternating, the Vandermon in the v's, and then the sum of S, the Schur polynomial in u times that in v for every uh, tuple of powers. And I'm just splitting it according to the sum of the powers and then these partition. Except again, the slight notational issue of this being not, you know, partitions, but strictly decreasing tuples of integers. But yeah, they denote, that's just the notation thing. The, you know, the idea is the same. The identity is unchanged. Okay, this was generalized a few uh, decades later by Frobenius, uh, extended to a, a sum of two geometric series. And then this, this is the, so you know, one over one minus T is one geometric series and then CT over one minus T is another. And then you get a similar expansion. Again, you get the Vandermonds to come out. And there is a, some factor as well, a scalar factor. And then you get uh, this sum. So, okay. So ah, maybe I don't know if one can move this slightly. So yeah. there's just a question there. And the question is what happens for other power series? Yeah. yeah. So, thanks. So uh, let's look at some easy cases, I guess. So uh, suppose F, so I write down F as a polynomial with let's say less than N terms. Oops, sorry. Yeah, with strictly less than N terms. The point is if you apply any single monomial to a matrix UI times VJ, then you get uh, UI to the N1, VJ to the N1. So if you apply it to a rank one matrix, you still get a rank one matrix. And so when you add up K many of them, and if K is less than N, then this matrix is singular. So it's determinant is zero. Easy, <clears throat> sorry. What if there are exactly N terms, as many terms as, uh, as many monomials as the size of the matrix, then now you potentially get a full rank matrix. So in that case, it's different, but this is exactly the classical case, if you will, because then you'll write down this matrix. It actually factorizes as a product of three square matrices. The first, the outer matrices are generalized Vandermonds. So you know the determinant. That's exactly the Schur polynomial times the usual Vandermond. The inner matrix is diagonal. So you know the determinant. So yeah, so this is easy again. And now this basically, this recipe tells you how to work it out for every polynomial. You, know, you write down the long matrix at the beginning and then a tall matrix at the end and a huge diagonal matrix and use something called the cauchy binet formula. Okay, so to take so many, no, no. N many, every and every subset of N many columns here, the same subset of N many rows there, and then you, know, you multiply with the corresponding monomials, uh, F product, product of the FJs. Okay, so that was about the algebra side. Uh, and uh, we next come to, as I said, the fact that entry-wise functions were studied in analysis. And uh, so they were studied as early as sort of morally speaking by sure, but explicitly identified by Polia and Zigo in 1925, in the 1920s. And then over the years with Schoenberg and Rudin and other people, uh, in the 1960s, uh, so we are moving ahead in time now, uh, Lovner, uh, Charles Lovner studied uh, the, same, the same idea, but now with over the real numbers, not algebraically, uh, as a function of t. So let's say you have a smooth function, you take, uh, if you fix a vector u uh, in Rn, and let's say take pairwise distinct entries, so you, know, you don't just get zeros when you take determinants. Right? You don't get two identical rows or identical columns. And now define this delta of t. This is his notation for uh, the determinant of f of t times u, u transpose. Right? And because f is smooth, this function is smooth, you can start computing its Taylor coefficients. What do you get? Okay. So what Lovner saw was the first n choose two derivatives. So the zeroth order, the first order, and so on. The first n choose two derivatives are zero. Basically, because when you evaluate it at, uh, non zero, and this is what you get. So it's uh, the Vandermont square, and then you get a uh, product of these Taylor coefficients, if you will. What Lovner 
I should say, it's a joke, of course, but what Lovner missed is that he missed a factor of one square in this, uh, in this expansion. And uh, well, so that, that, that was what sort of, uh, uh, yeah, that, that has implications. So, <clears throat> so uh, the reason why Lobner was looking at this was something to do with functions acting entry-wise on matrices, on positive semi-definite matrices, matrices whose eigenvalues are bigger equals zero. And then some question about when you start with the rank one matrix like this and you start with a function and it preserves positivity. Uh, so the, what you get later on also is positive semi-definite uh, for some which smooth functions does that kind of thing hold and so he was looking at it for some analysis reasons which as I said I'm, I also look at now but what if he had so he didn't need anything more than this formula and he stopped there but what if he had gone one step further then you would he would have seen that he missed something more right so this is then you get a sure polynomial the simplest one this is the sure polynomial for one cell one row with one cell in it this is the sure polynomial for zero rows or for zero cells. This is the sure polynomial for one cell. Okay. And you get the same kind of products of derivatives. So the point is, yeah, you have to take distinct number of derivatives of different columns. So the only way you can do this for n choose two is if you take zero derivatives, one derivative, n minus one derivatives. The only way you can do it for n choose two plus one also is you take zero derivatives till n minus two. And then the n minus first derivative, you have to differentiate further that column. Okay, so this is what he got. And so Lobner was at Stanford, of course. So um, as, as Christian mentioned, I used to work there before coming here. So um, I went one fine day to the library. So huh, so I should point out, uh, Lobner wrote, so Lobner found this calculation that at least communicated it in October 1967. And he passed away about two or three months later. So this was one of the last things he did. And when he passed away, all his papers went to the library, Stanford Library. So I went there and I asked for those and leafed through those papers, browsed through them. And I found this handwritten letter to Josephine Mitchell, where he said, you know, I got interested in this following question, that F be a function defined on some interval, some domain, consider all real symmetric matrices, which are positive semi-definite of a fixed order N with elements in that domain of F. What properties must F have in order that the matrices entry-wise f of aij are positive semi-definite and i found that if f is n minus one times differentiable then the function is non-negative the derivative is non-negative and so on and so forth all the first n order derivatives are non-negative and then some counter example for trying one more derivative to be non-negative and so on the proof is obtained by considering matrices of the form i essentially told you and then you see here's f uh, the determinant i found no the, the first the first non-zero term, I guess, in the Taylor expansion of delta, delta is the determinant here, uh, is exactly the product of these f's and then this Vandermont square, right? So you see the one is missing, right? So uh, yeah, so anyway, then the letter goes on, but so this is the calculation he had done. And later on, uh, so he communicated, he told his PhD student about it, Roger Horn, who is the author of Horn and Johnson, Matrix Analysis. So uh, Roger's paper, this might have been his first paper. Uh, it presented this result, citing it for citing Lovner. Okay, so this sort of so this seems to not have been discovered before. And so, in general, you can work with instead of u times u transpose, which is what Lovner did, you can work with u times v transpose. Hardly anything different. But so yeah, let's say we are given a function formally. So to formally state the question, given a function on some domain, let's say a smooth function, take pairwise distinct uh, scalars. We don't need that. We can put the Vandermonds in the numerator uh, and set the de delta of t to be this thing and compute its derivatives. Right? So that's what Lovner was doing. And so you can even set u times v transpose and that turns out to uncover every single sure polynomial in the correct degree for the correct derivative order of differentiation. Right? So. Um, fix u and v, then, then so let's say positive scalars, take delta of t to be this function, then the Taylor coefficient is exactly along the same lines. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is in the real topology, but you can also present an algebraic version of this fact, and you can find the same details in the same place. So in some sense, every sure polynomial occurs inside every smooth function. Okay. Uh, I should have said, if you have questions, yes, please. 
the sum is over all partitions of M. So you don't add the, the staircase there. Uh, the, again, these are- The uh, sum of the Ns is really M. Yes, in this case, the sum include with the, with the staircase is M. The because notation for partitions is the usual one. Sorry? The notation for partitions for- Yeah, everything is here. The, everything includes the staircase, yeah. yeah. I, the reason, so the, the reason I'm including the staircase may not be obvious here. It will show up when I do majorization inequalities. Then I really need the partitions to have staircases. Well, the NIs are strictly distinct. For example, the simplest case uh, was uh, here. The NIs have to be distinct here. Yeah, and here as well. So yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. So yeah. All the, the 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 notation throughout the talk is the NIs are distinct and strictly decreasing, and that will be needed when I do majorization. So that's why I could have done. I didn't want to do half and half. You know, not use the staircase and then use the staircase. Okay. So this yeah. So this is so now if f is a power series, then so is delta. You can. So instead of taking a smooth function, take a nicer smooth function, like a polynomial or a power series. In that case, what is the expansion of um, this delta? It's basically when you add this up, that's what you get, right? And the, but this is exactly the problem that Cauchy and Frobenius had considered sort of algebraically. And now Lohner essentially was leading up to it through his matrix analysis. So uh, yeah, so again, this is maybe not too hard to show, but the point is this is true in both uh, commutative unital ring in the algebraic setting, convergence in that formal or t-adic topology, and true in the real analysis setting, in the, in the real topology with some suitable inside some suitably small radius. So yeah, when you write this formula down, you get, you know, you can first of all also grade it by the total degree and then write this thing down. Okay, this is one example of, you know, sort of um, symmetric function identities that follow from starting from Cauchy and Frobenius. There are plenty of others. These are just a small sample of other you know, people who have worked on it over the years. And so uh, including, you know, of course, in, in the sessions chairs uh, works, you can find a bunch of them as well <clears throat> in this sessions chair. Yeah, so um, one small thing I want to, so let me end this part of the talk then with uh, a small extension in one direction, which is you can go from determinants to, for example, you can ask what happens if I take the permanent? And then, so uh, this is joined with Siddharth Sahi of Rutgers. So we answered this, we, so we wrote down this formula for permanence. And the interesting thing was, uh, so this was proved, this can be proved in several different ways. One is somewhat uh, formally, um, algebraically and so on. One is using the cauchy binet formula. What we proved with Siddharth Sahi was we did this, we worked out a shorter proof than this using group representation theory of the symmetric group. And that same, proof basically shows the formula, shows this formula as well, and works for every single irreducible representation, not just the one dimensional ones. So you can work it out for all imminents, <clears throat> not just for the symmetric group, but for subgroups of SN, similar formulas exist. But then we can all, one can also do this for, uh, you know, so these are the, these, this is the formula or the previous one when the variables commute, the UI is commute, UI UJ equals UJ UI, and VI VJ equals VJ VI. But you can also do this for anti-commuting UIs and anti-commuting VJs. How they interact is a different matter. That can be anything. But so if you have fermionic UIs or and fermionic VJs, then one gets some similar identities. Those are finite, of course, because even the square is zero. Okay, so one potential question for thought, and again, I'm not an expert in, in, in this thing, uh, is uh, potentially are there, uh, can one extend in either fermionic or imminent or both directions of various other, you know, uh, symmetric function identities in these and other papers. So that's, that's one direction to go. But this is definitely one evergreen uh, line of, you know, study, symmetric function identities involving determinants and imminents and so on. Okay, so that was one, so that was one part of the talk. And then the other part was about inequalities again, involving functions acting entry-wise on matrices. So that's the underlying theme that Lovner, as I said, started out on and Polya and Zigo and Schoenberg and Rudin before him, uh, and but actually Cauchy before all of them in the algebraic side. Yeah, so the sure polynomials lurking inside all the smooth functions actually really play a crucial role. They were sort of missing from the analysis literature. Uh, somehow people had not... Uh, thought to tap into representation theory uh, or these symmetric functions to 
try and attack some of these problems. Uh, about entry-wise maps, entry-wise functions, polynomials, in fact, that preserve positive semi-definiteness on matrices. Okay? So these are algebraic functions, but they need to be studied actually as functions in analysis, namely functions with some domain of positive real numbers. Okay? And uh, okay, so let's go back to an example. These are functions now, which we have, so as I said, that's why I need them only on finitely many variables, not infinitely many. This is now an analysis question I'm looking at. So look at the function of three variables and all the three are positive real numbers. Okay. So clearly, you know, these are what we call monomial positive. They're sums of monomials. So they don't, there are no negative signs. Yeah. So uh, in particular, if you look on the positive orthant, then the functions increase in every single coordinate. Yes. <clears throat> That's because they're monomially positive. Now you can do notice that the, 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 the degree of this, the total degree of this function is bigger than that, but the lower one does not divide the upper function. Right? So if I look at the ratio of these functions, I don't get a polynomial. It is a ratio of two polynomials, which are both coordinate wise increasing which are monomial positive in fact. Uh, so, but the point is the ratio actually has the same property. It is also coordinate wise increasing. So both numerator and denominator are monomial positive. In fact, sure positive, meaning they are sums of sure polynomials because they are each one sure polynomial, but they are also non-decreasing. It's the ratio is non-decreasing as well. Okay. <clears throat> so, this is uh, this actually again seems to not have been known in the literature so this is a result from december 21 published december 21 so if i take any integer tuples n1 through n n then so this is where i will need a yeah on the next slide probably so yeah such that uh, the mjs coordinate wise dominate the ngs and look at this function this is a function defined everywhere on the positive orthon and it is non decreasing and there is a stronger sure positivity phenomenon, which I will yeah, tell you now. So uh, yeah, this was this was the theorem. Uh, let me go back to the special case of the example. And how does one prove that something is coordinate is monotone in some direction? Well, first of all, this is symmetric, right? This is a ratio of two symmetric functions. So it's enough to check that it's coordinate wise non decreasing in um, I think I'll do u three in this slide. I think I have done u three in this slide. Yeah. So how do you check that something is monotone? You take the derivative and hope it's positive, right? So take the derivative, in the usual way we teach it, uh, low d high minus high d low, and notice that this is actually monomial positive as well. So technically there's a denominator square, but I don't care because I'm looking at the sign of the derivative. So this is monomial positive, And so on the positive orthant, it, it's numerically positive. Right? But there's something stronger that's going on. So this is clearly not symmetric in the three variables, but it is symmetric in two variables, right? It's differentiated with U3. So in U1 and U2, it stays symmetric. Let's look at the coefficients of each monomial, each power of U3. <clears throat> so it turns out that every such function is actually a sum of sure polynomials. So there is some sure positivity embedded inside this derivative being numerically positive. So there's a u3 here, so there's no constant term. u3 power 0 has no term. u3 power 1 has the coefficient, this coefficient, which is exactly a Schur polynomial plus a Schur polynomial itself. And then the coefficient of u3 square is u1 plus u2 square, I guess. So the coefficient, that's u1 square plus u1 u2 plus another u1 u2 plus u2 square. And that's the sum of two Schur polynomials. So that was something pretty surprising <clears throat> to us. And then uh, the, the proof is exactly the same for general number of variables and general powers, I guess. Um, yeah, so by symmetry, you do the same thing. You, you hope it's numerically positive. It would follow if this is monomially positive. And in fact, you do the same check and it's sure positive. The key result we use here is uh, is a really strong identity by Lamb, Postnikov, and Pilyowski uh, in 2007. But that in turn emerged out of uh, work of Marx Kandera on totally non negative matrices, uh, which also is some, a fascinating paper. <clears throat> Sorry. So, 
Okay, so that was a nice fact, but now that's what consequences does that fact have is where I'm going with this to majorization. So this lemma implied that if you take, you know, M dominates N coordinate wise and you look at the ratio on the positive orthant, but actually on a smaller part of it. So this is, these are the coordinates where the each entry is bigger than one, meaning the log is positive. So let me call it the log positive orthant. So if this, if this beats the, so we know that if uh, U is in the log positive orthant, then this ratio beats the ratio value at once. And as we know from the wild dimension formula, that's just the ratio of the van der Mons of the powers. So it's natural to ask this question. You know, is it only these powers? Is this dominating phenomenon that works? Or does it work elsewhere? It works elsewhere. <clears throat> and it works not just for integer powers, but it works for real powers. But how do you define this thing for real powers? So the way you define it is you multiply and divide by the van der Mond in the variable u. Then you just get a generalized van der Mond matrix by the Cauchy definition. And that's what we look at. So this is the matrix ui power mj and ui power nj. Okay, so the ratio of the van der Mons, generalized van der Mons, beats that term for all tuples, except I have a denominator here, so I cannot take, so I have to take unequal coordinates. It's a dense set, so in analysis, that's fine, right? <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, yeah, this, this ratio beats the above ratio, the value at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or the limit at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, for all distinct tuples, if and only if M weakly majorizes it. So again, starting from sure polynomials, another, <laughs> in algebra, one gets to basic inequalities of real numbers, uh, so weak majorization, meaning the, yeah. And the ingredients are, uh, so we have to come up with something called the first order approximation of sure polynomials, or the, basically isolate the leading term of sure polynomials. And when you have leading terms, again, this is analysis. Mm. And then one uses this harish chandra zuber integral and a sure convexity result. But that's the one that connects to majorization or weak majorization. It turns out, of course, that, or not it turns out, this, this kind of idea to uh, connect sure polynomials to weak majorization was not new. It was done about 10 years ago uh, for majorization. So what Cutler, Green, and Scandera did uh, in the 2010s was they looked at the same inequality, this inequality, but now, instead of just the log positive orthant, look at all of the positive orthant. Then what happens? So the point is, suppose M has total degree bigger than N, right? Then, <clears throat> then on the log positive orthant, sure, it can dominate as asymptotically. But when M has total degree bigger than N and the U goes to zero, then this inequality should get reversed. So at least you know that the total degree should be the same. And once you have the total degree is the same and this holds, that's called majorization. Right? When you have the total content of the M's and the N's to be equal and this holds, then you get majorization. And so that's exactly the result that they proved uh, that if this inequality holds on the full positive orthant, then, um, <clears throat> then M actually majorizes it. And they asked the question, is the converse true? If M majorizes N, is this inequality true on the entire positive orthant? <laughs> That turns out to be true. That was proved by Sovrit Sra uh, five years later after their conjecture. So this is the result. Fix integers, uh, pairs of powers, and I will keep adopting the same notation uh, uh, with strict inequalities. The Schur polynomial beats the value at one, 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 one throughout the orthant, no? not just log positive, but if and only if M majorizes N. And that's so part of it is essentially why I told you. Okay, so then, so one can of course ask now, first of all, does this hold for real powers? I mean, what's special about integer powers? And secondly, do you need the entire positive orthant or can you work with a smaller set? Yeah. So uh, to deduce, you know, to deduce that M majorizes N. So uh, yes and yes. So given any pair of uh, real tuples, and I don't need it to be positive or no, non-negative or anything. The following are equivalent. First of all, this inequality holds for all. Again, I need to take distinct tuples <coughs> yeah, and take generalized Vandermonts instead of sure polynomials. 
if and only if it holds for all distinct tuples in the log positive orthon and the log negative orthon. So I don't need the rest of the information. Actually, even this can be weakened to one sequence, countable sequence here and countable sequence there. But anyway, if and only if M major is M. So first of all, the takeaway from this at least is that majorization, just like weak majorization, can be worked out for real tuples in terms of van der Mond matrices. Not just, you know, um, I mean, it's slightly more general than for integer tuples in terms of sure polynomials. The reason is because I'm going to tell you about uh, a vast generalization of this to, by Max Wigan and Novak. <clears throat> so, okay, uh, since I do have some time, I'll give you a small sketch of one of the parts. So, if it works for all tuples, it works for, you know, a smaller set, that's obvious. Three implies one. If it majorizes n, then this holds. So, Suvrichra proved it when these are non-negative integers. So, the proof in general goes through pretty much the same way. <clears throat> Sorry, with Harish Chandra at six and Zuber's integral. The part I want to tell you quickly is why two implies three follows sort of relatively straightforward from our previous result. So, so this is sort of a strengthening of Cutler, Green, and Skandera in two ways. One is the powers are no longer integers, and the this is no longer uh, yeah uh, the the full orthant is not needed. So no, I, I thought I will put at least one proof in the talk. So this is that proof. Yeah, so uh, if so, if u okay, sorry. So if u belongs to the log positive orthant, and we have this inequality, then we know that m majorizes weakly majorizes m. That was by the, our previous result with tau. And then if u is in the log negative orthant, just invert, take the reciprocals, and then compute this ratio first of all, the vj vi's to the minus mj's. But that's exactly the same as ui to the mj's. So this ratio equals this ratio. <clears throat> which we are given to be uh, bigger than the ratio of the Vandermonts, which is the ratio of the negatives Vandermonts. And now if you look at the first term beating the last term, where the first term is in indeed in the log positive orthant, then you get minus M weakly majorizes minus N. And we know M weakly majorizes N. And together they are if and only if M majorizes N. That's basically from the definitions. The content is the same. So that was the one proof I had so in the talk. So yeah, so now, so this was about using sure polynomials. What if you use other things? So um, this is Cutler, Green, and Scandera. Let's go back to integer tuples, basically. Right? Instead, if one uses something called the monomial symmetric polynomial, then this goes back 100 years, more than 100 years. And this is called Muirhead's inequality. Interestingly, he also had real scalar powers, as far as I know. You take real a tuple of real powers, another tuple of real powers, and look at the same kind of normalized. So what I did in the previous formulation was the this the numerator and this denominator were flipped. I'm just flipping them here. To write down the normalized Schur polynomial beats a normalized Schur polynomial. The same kind of philosophy was adopted by Muirhead earlier. The normalized monomial symmetric beats this one for all you in the positive orthant entire positive orthon, if and only if M majorizes M. So the same conclusions using a different symmetric <clears throat> function. So it's very natural to ask. I don't know the answer, but uh, if someone wants to think about it, please do. What happens if you restrict to the log positive orthon here? Or for example, is there some subset that leads to a characterization of weak majorization rather than full majorization? Okay, that's the other question. Uh, that's the second question. And there's, I will end with a third question. <laughs> so uh, this, this slide is essentially thanks to Cutler, Green, and Scandera. In their paper, they mention all these lovely historical, they do the nice historical survey. And so there are various other inequalities of the same kind of flavor, just like there were symmetric function identities, a bunch of them of similar flavors in the first part of the talk. But these go back even <laughs> earlier by hundred years. To Maclaurin and Newton and so on. And uh, yeah, recently uh, there was a vast generalization of these uh, inequalities, majorization inequalities by Max Wigan and Novak in a beautiful, really beautiful paper in uh, 2022. It appeared this year to first of all, uh, yeah, they first of all developed the idea of W majorization for W being a while group of a semi-simple D algebra. So again, representation theory comes in. 
the idea is very simple. There is a different characterization of majorization, right? A real tuple is majorized by another. If you take that, the majorizing tuple, I guess, look at the, the convex hull of all the n factorial points where its coordinates are permuted or modulo the stabilizer. Take the convex hull and this other point must lie inside that convex hull. That's the other definition of majorization. Well, all you do now is in the, for W majorization is the symmetry group is the while group of type A in type A. You look at an arbitrary while group and you look at you know, a vector in the reflection representation of that while group and take, so lambda majorizes mu if mu is in the W, so convex hull of the W orbit of lambda, where W is the while group. Right? And then with that, they looked at, you know, uh, analogs of this, uh, the, 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 the cutler green skandera sra identity, the theorem. And they developed a characterization of W majorization. In that case, uh, again, but but they did it in the uh, in the spirit of my result with tau, in the sense that they did not, I think, needed to line. They did not need the indexing powers or tuple like n and m to be integers. Real numbers were so real numbers meaning any points. You know, like you can talk about. Okay, maybe I should say it the other way, right? So when I gave you the n factorial convex polytope definition that did not require the points to have integer coordinates. That could be with any real coordinates, right? And the same way our result did not have integer powers, it could have any real powers and generalized van der Mond matrices. So the same thing for them. They did not require integer coordinates of any kind or in some lattice. So the, the way to generalize the analogs of these ratios of Schur polynomials or Schur polynomials are spherical functions, which you know even people like Harish Chandra studied in the 1950s and so on, long time since then on Riemannian symmetric spaces of compact, non-compact type, which led to the other two compact and flat types and so on. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful paper. They then conjecture that this holds even more generally than spherical functions and symmetric spaces for something that is called, I don't know much about this, Heckman of them hypergeometric functions. This would, ex this would first of all extend cutler green Skandera from sure to Jack. It would also subsume the, uh, what was the 1903 inequality I told you? Muirhead's inequality. That is not subsumed by this so far, but that would be subsumed by if one can prove this conjecture. And then the pipe dream, of course, is to extend all the way from Jack to McDonald polynomials. So, but uh, we invited uh, Max Spig and Colin to give a talk here uh, remotely. And uh, as far as I remember, he mentioned that this, even the formulation of such a more, more general conjecture is not known for McDonald. It is known for the Jack at least the conjecture. Proving it is a different matter, but the McDonald extension is not even formulated. So another thing to you know, look at, but, but yeah, this is really a beautiful stuff. And the fact that it extends in such vast generality and holds in such vast generality. Okay, so the final, in the final five or 10 minutes, uh, something like that, I will uh, end with my third and final problem, which is, which combines optimization and sure polynomials. So uh, again, this, the flavor was that, you know, sure polynomials are very, very uh, uh, crucial to some problems in ana analysis and they end up revealing things like majorization and weak majorization from sure polynomials. So uh, here is a specific class of sure polynomials for which the Young diagram is just a single row. Right? They're called the complete homogeneous symmetric polynomials. And so, yeah, you just, you basically take, yeah, this is the definition. And notice now here again, inequalities. So here are inequalities. H naught by convention is one. H two, uh, let me look at the even degree polynomials. This is the sum of UI squared plus this. And that is the summation of the UI whole square plus the summation of UI squared, the individual power sum. And then you average it out. So clearly this is a sum of squares. This is a sum of squares. So this is a square. So the whole thing is numerically non-negative again, right? numerically positive. In fact, it turns out that H4, H6, every even degree uh, complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial is again, numerically uh, non-negative. <clears throat> it's in fact, strictly positive, not just non-negative, it is strictly positive except at the origin. So slightly stronger. This was a result proved by Hunter, uh, I think about 50 years ago or maybe even more, but the proof has, there is a one line proof uh, using probability by, uh, I believe the, well, at least I saw it first in uh, Alexander Barwinock's preprint on the archive. And it says, take standard exponential variables, IID. Right? And look at this, take 
these the scalars u1 u2 un in the real line in, in reals and take this linear combination u1 z1 plus so on plus un zn okay look at the moments of this random variable so expectation of the kth power it turns out that is exactly up to a scalar the complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial so now the point is unless all the uis are zero this random variable is not identically constant or identically zero in fact so if the power is even and it's not identically zero then the moment is strictly positive that's it so uh, which other sure polynomials share this property right maybe there are others not just the slides from now so um, that turns out to be not so hard uh, sorry so there are no others so none right? so suppose this is true then the sure polynomial is non-vanishing here and if it's non-vanishing and it's monomial positive ah, ah well okay it's, if it's non-vanishing then already you can prove that the sure polynomial is complete homogeneous symmetric and therefore new and therefore strictly positive that was by Barvinox observation, right? So if it's always non-vanishing, then it is always positive, except at the origin. Okay? That was not too hard to prove. That's just an easy calculation. But now let me tell you why I care about this property. It's because of the following. So the 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 question that I have. So let me remind you of this sure monotonicity lemma. Right? If you have integer tuples and you take this ratio, uh, then and and I stick to bigger equals n m bigger equals n in each coordinate so okay. then this is non-decreasing and in particular i want to know where is the supremum on the unit cube uh, on the punctured unit cube because this is not defined at you know this is yeah at, at the origin so let's avoid the origin it, so it takes uh, its supremum in the punctured unit cube at the top point it's coordinate wise non-decreasing i want to understand this question over minus one one to the n, not just zero one to the n. Okay, but if I want to do this over minus one one to the n, then I need to find a polynomial. I need to find integer tuple for which I am guaranteed that this doesn't you know, degenerate at random points. And at least one safe choice is to say, well, let me choose an integer tuple for which the denominator never vanishes. Then I don't. Care. And I mean, I can say non-vanishing on the full thing or on a compact ball around the origin just by homogeneity, right? So I just want it to not vanish on, on the unit two-sided cube or on Rn minus Z. So that's why, uh, <clears throat> that's why it's at least a safe choice to start with a complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial and now ask the same question. Does one know what the behavior of this is? I don't even sort of, so, Okay, fine. Let me ask the question first. So suppose n is this tuple of powers and m, again, the numerator powers beat the denominator powers coordinate wise. Define the same ratio. Right? Now I know that, uh, I mean, this can become negative uh, on in other orthoms, but the denominator is never negative because it's a homogeneous polynomial of even degree. Right? How does this function behave? More precisely, what I care about only, uh, in some sense, I'll tell you why, is where does it attain the supremum? Is it, I, mean, I just want, I don't even care where it attains the supremum. I want to know what the supremum is, actually. Yeah. It would be nice to know where it attains the supremum, but I just care about what is the supremum. And the point is, uh, okay, first of all, let me just, yeah. So by homogeneity, it's enough to consider the, this problem is well-defined, it doesn't blow up because, no, the powers above beat the powers below. So things are of positive homogeneous total degree. So you know it scales, it grows bigger. So it's enough to look at the boundary, which is a compact set. This is a continuous function on the boundary. Where is the maximum? Very simple question to state. Um, and probably also because it's a compact set, one can run simulations or do something. I haven't looked at it yet. But the point is, yeah, if one can answer the, at least what the value of the supremum is, and nothing else that will already give me some extra you know the consequences give us some consequences for entry wise polynomials that preserve positivity on matrices with possibly negative entries as well so the problem in negative entries is not as well behaved and nice as for strictly positive entries one reason being that such a result is known such an optimization is known for positive orthant but not for the full uh, set 
if one can find at least find out the supremum of this polynomial, even in two variables or three variables, you know, then that would give us some consequences as well. Okay, so I think that was pretty much it. So just for, yeah, so these, these were some of the many articles that have been written on symmetric function identities from Cauchy and Frobenius to Lovner. This was sort of not algebraic, but on the analysis side, some of them, you know, uh, I think this one by Michael and uh, Rosengren, I didn't mention previously, but it's another one. And on the majorization side, again, starting from even earlier and going all the way to Max Wigan and Novak, uh, yeah, uh, majorization and spherical functions. And let us hope that it actually goes ahead all the way to uh, Heckman Optum and even to Jack and McDonald. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any questions? You, I guess. Oh. Wonderful talk. Oh, that was great. So I'm wondering after all of this, how would you define sure functions maybe in a new way in, in context using positivity? That, ah. <laughs> the sure functions I think are the same. Uh, I mean, one way to define it is the things that show up in Lovner's calculation, maybe, I don't know. But so it's one thing- basis, So I don't know how to like phrase it that way, right? What, what are those functions? There's some factors that come up in this expansion. Right, right. That would be one way to think about it. That's in some sense in, the, in my matrix positivity side, that's how I think about sure functions is they are the functions that show up when you take these identities, apply a function to rank one matrix and expand the determinant out. And they're exactly the functions that show up in the coefficients. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, I should just add one more thing that morally it's, uh, you know, uh, morally I, given this last paper with Tao where we worked things out for sums of real powers rather than just polynomials, sums of integer powers, uh, the boundary between sure functions and generalized van der Mond determinants has started to blur for me now, yeah, so. They seem to be equally well behaved in the things we wanted them to do, including even majorization inequalities. So, yeah. could you say a little more about what the functions are that show up for Mix Wigan and Novak? Um, ah, like the analog of great. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, well, again, I'm not an expert, but sure, if you insist, let's go. <laughs> okay. I did not plant you in the audience, not the question. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, should we turn on the light or something? Maybe if you have two minutes, I can. I'll actually take you through two slides, which expand on what Thank they you. do. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> W majorization. So let V be a Euclidean space containing a crystallographic root system uh, with this while with while group for notation. Right. So W is generated by the hyperplanes orthogonal to the roots. So we say W uh, lambda and mu. I'm now I think adopting their notation. W majorizes mu if mu lies in the convex hull of this orbit, as I said. So special case being of type A, W is the symmetric group, and then lambda SN majorizes is exactly the same as lambda majorizes mu. That's the theorem or the lemma, I guess. Right? So, uh, okay, so this is all the technical stuff. There's only one slide. So let G be a uh, connected Lie group, and then you look at such a group with a involution whose uh, you know, fixed uh, stabilizer subgroup is compact. That's what one calls a Riemannian symmetric space. Of there are they are of three types, in, and then under certain further assumptions which they make, the authors make, you know, you have this Iwasawa decomposition and the weights of the Lie algebra form a root system. Okay, so one studies W majorization for uh, exactly for lambda and mu inside this Lie algebra. Um, the analogs of normalized Schur polynomials then are exactly these spherical functions. Uh, again, there's some notation that I will state, but yeah, basically. Those are the spherical functions uh, for which they. So you look at when huh, you have to perturb by you have to multiply by i. But yeah, you look at when this function beats this function on g mod k, and that is if and only if lambda majorizes mu. So roughly speaking, and then I guess I will probably refer you to this their paper. This this part is from the last slide. Yeah. But beyond this, yeah. So uh, I would just say look at the paper. But it's a very very clearly written paper, and uh, yeah, 
And the point is, what, what they show somehow is that once they are able to prove this thing for G mod K of non-compact type, it follows the same kind of majorization inequality follows for the other two types of symmetric spaces. That's from a very cursory reading at it, their paper. Okay, well, thank you very much. Some other question? Perhaps. So just kind of a follow up on Sarah's because she mentioned like this doesn't seem to form a basis, but can you actually extend definitions to get a basis for this uh, in this generalized context? Sorry, which context? I mean, well, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> they are the same polynomials. I mean, there's no difference. So they do form a, that's that's what they form. I mean, but, uh, but in so uh, real power or you know, your oh power. yeah. Oh, real powers. Yeah, but the basis of which? Yeah, but space. Then, yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of uh, like symmetric functions in a product in some continuous way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't know of this. No, not yet. In fact, the functions themselves. If you look at, for example, uh, just the generalized van der Mond determinants, I don't think they are very well studied in any case as functions. Uh, as functions, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I think like Tao has a blog post, which was written again, obviously during this paper, when we were working out the continuous case, he wrote down some set of observations about, I think maybe he called them continuous sure functions or something. And you yeah. can look at that, right? So that, yeah, that was exactly in this paper's writing that it happened, but that's about all that I know of. So it's, I think it's known that they're, they, they are defined only when the arguments are pairwise distinct, obviously, generalized van der Mond, but then they extend continuously and so on. Beyond that, yeah, how much kind of a basis they form, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, again, um, these are sort of functions that, you know, uh, de degenerate or something to polynomials. And you could look at, for example, rational functions, you could look at ratios. So the space of symmetric functions would probably be much larger. Yeah. Right. So uh, all maybe one can ask, are they linearly independent or something? But beyond that, I don't know much more to say. And linear independence is probably something you can prove by isolating the leading term, which are which are distinct for distinct tuples. Yes. The leading terms are distinct, so probably their asymptotic arguments give you linear independence directly. Thank you. Yeah. A small addition: Kevin Cadell wrote a paper where he extends the sure functions to complex indices. Kevin Cadell. Uh -huh. Complex exponents, you mean? Complex yeah. powers. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, I should ask you for that paper. <laughs> um, is there another uh, question? Bishal has a question. Yeah. So you've mentioned uh, majorization for sure and also monomial symmetric polynomials. Yes. But yes. what about elementary symmetric or complete homogeneous? There are uh, some results in, so again, Cutler, Green, and Skandera mention all these results. And I think elementary, at least, I think. Or maybe even both of them uh, and, show and, up in that paper. So you should look at that paper for the details. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, follow up. Uh, so uh, E positivity or H positivity implies sure positivity implies monomial positive. Mm. Is there some relation to the story? What is E positivity? Just sums of E's. Yes. Ah, sums of E's and sums of H's. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the example we had, it was, was it ease? It wasn't ease. There were, there were three cells, right? And two and one. So it wasn't E, but it still did imply monomial positivity in some sense. So, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know really. Maybe there are, maybe that also happens, that does happen in itself. But uh, yeah, right. at I least mean, in the proof we saw, we didn't need it. We didn't use that. Yeah. Like, uh, so maybe something to do with, the uh, space, uh, so so you mentioned it's uh, the log positive or ten, but then yes. that lies within zero infinity power, and but maybe or that's a fair point. Yes. Uh, yeah, that that's a good question. I have wondered, you know, what why what's why bigger than one 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 one? Why not two 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 or half 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 or you know what happens for other things? I I, I don't think anything is known. No, nothing is known. You get some necessary conditions or something, but nothing more than that. So characterization is not known. Okay, I think we have to close the question period. So let us thank Apurva for a great talk again. <laughs>